Thank you for standing by. My name is Krista and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Union Group First Quarter 2024 Earnings Conference Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during that time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. And if you would like to withdraw that question, again, press star one. Thank you. I would now like to turn the conference over to Matt Royal, Head of Investor Relations. Matt, you may begin your conference. Thank you, Krista, and good morning to everyone. Welcome to Unum Group's first quarter 2024 earnings call. Please note that today's call may include forward-looking statements and actual results which are subject to risk and uncertainties may differ materially, and we are not obligated to update any of these statements. Please refer to our earnings release and our periodic filings with the SEC for a description of factors that could cause actual results to differ from expected results. Yesterday afternoon, Unum released our first quarter earnings press release and financial supplement. Those materials may be found on the investor section of our website, along with a presentation of the most directly comparable gap measures and reconciliations of any non-gap financial measures included in today's presentation. References made to today to core operation sales and premium, including Unum International, are presented on a constant currency basis. Participating in this morning's conference call are Unum's President and CEO, Rick McKinney, Chief Financial Officer, Steve Zabel, Tim Arnold, who heads our Colonial Life and Voluntary Benefit Lines, Chris Pine for Group Benefits, and Mark Till, CEO of Unum International. Now, I'll turn the call over to Rick. Thank you, Matt. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We're excited to discuss our exceptional first quarter results with you, which reflect a strong start to the year and a continuation of the success achieved over the past several years. At our Outlook meeting in January, we laid out our expectations and plans to continue our momentum through 2024, including our ability to maintain industry-leading margins, grow our top line at a higher rate, and build further capital flexibility, including eliminating needs for our close block. Our first quarter results show our ability to execute on these plans with a 13.6% growth in EPS to $2.12 per share, a record level of earnings for the company. $350 million of statutory earnings, 6.6% increase in core operations premium growth and capital metrics well in excess of our targets. Coupled with our team's strong performance, the market backdrop and economic environment continues to be favorable and supportive of our business. The first quarter concluded on a positive note for the economy, with job growth surpassing expectations in March and a steady rise in wages. This was evident in our existing client base, as we observed sustained natural growth that played an ongoing role in our success, although at more typical levels. Our offerings, which are a part of an employer's holistic employment package in attracting and retaining talent, also have the important role of providing critical protections for their employees. Our connection with these employers has been amplified through our digital interactions with clients and our unparalleled ability to provide quality services, including leave administration, which is playing an important role for them. In addition to the labor market, interest rates have been in our favor, and consensus has shifted towards the higher for longer scenario. With Treasury yields up approximately 70 basis points so far this year, current rate levels are beneficial to both our core lines of business as we continue to invest new money above our portfolio yield, but also for long-term care. We continue to find ways to de-risk the block through our hedging strategy and repositioning, two levers we further utilized in the first quarter. Together, this macro backdrop aids us in steadily and consistently building on our solid foundation and delivering profitable growth and strong returns across all of our businesses. Looking across the franchise, there were numerous bright spots to highlight in the first quarter. First, our group products in Unum US, our deeply integrated solutions such as HR Connect and Total Leave continue to improve the operations of our employer clients. We continue to see attractive margins across our product sets based on the consistency of our pricing discipline and our aligned goals of helping employees get back to work. 
Our products and services are resonating with our customers, as shown by total group product persistency exceeding 90%, with long-term disability at 93%, a level we haven't seen in over 10 years. Group sales, where we see the most price competition, perform better than expectations in the quarter and are expected to meet our expectations for the year. These results underscore the value our employers, employees, and their families find in our products and services. Also within our U.S. business are supplementary and voluntary lines, including voluntary benefits, multi-life individual disability, and dental and vision continue to produce very strong levels of both top line and bottom line growth at 7.6% and 11.8% respectively. While these lines of business receive less attention, they generate high levels of cash and complement our group offering well as employers look to expand their benefit offerings and attract and retain talent in a highly competitive market. Shifting to colonial life, margins continue to be excellent with, a, with an ROE of nearly 20%. Since the pandemic, which impacted colonial distribution model, growth has been the main focus for this segment. And in the quarter, we saw premiums increase by just over 4%. While we're encouraged by the premium growth, sales in the first quarter did not meet our expectations. Despite this, we maintain optimism regarding our ongoing differentiation through services like Gather, as well as the productivity of our agents. These factors support our plans to reach the 5 to 10% sales growth range at our Outlook meeting. Rounding out our core segments, our international business is operating at full strength, with robust premium growth of nearly 17%, coming off an excellent sales year last year, and UK underlying earnings in the mid to upper £20 million range. We continue to see excellent growth momentum in our growing Poland business, and in the UK, we continue to redefine the broker experience, setting a market-leading standard that is distinctly unum and enhancing our relationship management model. Across the company, our commitment to innovation, prudent capital management, and shareholder returns remains unwavering. With the closed block fully funded, our capital generation model is at full strength as this is expected to be the first year in many years that we do not contribute capital to long-term care. Let me remind you that we do not, to plan, we do not plan to contribute capital to support the long-term care block going forward, given our assumptions and approximately $2.8 billion of protection that we outlined at our Outlook meeting. In the first quarter, the strong gap margins I mentioned earlier, highlighted by disability and life, translated directly to statutory earnings of $350 million. This supports cash flow available for deployment at a run rate greater than we have seen before. This consistent cash flow generation is supported by our disciplined and long-term focused underwriting approach, as well as our sole focus on employee benefits. With these good results, we ended the quarter with holding company liquidity of $1.4 billion and RBC of 440%. This provides additional flexibility as we explore opportunities to grow our core businesses and reduce our closed block exposure. At the same time, we have steadily increased the pace at which we return capital to shareholders. This quarter, we increased the pace of share purchases to approximately $500 million per year, double from a year ago. In addition, consistent annual dividend increases are another important part of our capital management. And we're pleased to announce that in recognition of our strong capital position and projections, we will be increasing our shareholder dividend by 15%, starting with a third quarter dividend payment in 2024, and placing our dividend payout ratio right around 20%. All in all, the first quarter was a very strong start for our company. We're encouraged by the trends we are seeing in our operations, as well as the support we're receiving from the macro environment. All this positions us well to be able to execute on our strategy and reach our financial aspirations throughout 2024 and beyond. Many thanks to our teams that work hard to serve our customers each and every day. I'd like to now hand it over to Steve to provide further insights into our financial strategy and outlook, as well as provide insight into the closed block. Thank you once again for your attention. Let me turn it over to Steve. Great. Thanks, Rick, and good morning, everyone. As Rick described, the first quarter was a very strong start to the year. Before getting into the details, I would like to highlight a few of the key trends that are driving the impressive results across our businesses. 
First, from the top line perspective, we're seeing high levels of growth in our core operations with premium growth of 6.6%, bolstered by record levels of persistency in our group lines and nearly 17% premium growth for Unum International. In addition to growth, our margins continue to be robust with group disability maintaining the exceptional benefit ratio levels produced in 2023. Group life and AD&D earnings at levels not seen since pre-pandemic, and long-term care benefits continuing to normalize as expected. Putting it all together, these trends allow us to grow the company's earnings power and further our financial flexibility. In the quarter, we grew adjusted operating earnings 9.6% to $514.5 million, leading to after-tax adjusted operating earnings per share of $2.12, representing growth of 13.4%. On the statutory side, after-tax operating income was up 26.9% to $350.5 million, driving further capital strength with RBC and holding company liquidity well in excess of our targets. While we are only one quarter into the year, all of these factors reinforce our confidence in executing against our targets for 2024. Considering that backdrop, I'll now move to this segment financial results. Starting with Unum US, adjusted operating income increased 23.3% to $385.2 million in the first quarter of 2024, compared to $312.5 million in the first quarter of 2023. Results for all product lines improved year over year, with our group life and AD&D lines seeing the greatest improvement driven by favorable mortality trends, leading to a 68.2% benefit ratio. Natural growth of lives and wages returned to more normal levels of approximately 2%, and along with total group persistency of 92.1%, supported premium growth of 6.1% in Unum US. Overall, Unum U.S. sales were lower in the first quarter of 2024 by $2.5 million, or approximately 1% year-over-year. Group sales increased 2.5% compared to the first quarter of 2023, while sales in supplemental and voluntary lines did not meet our expectations and were down 4%. As Rick mentioned, group sales performed better than expectations in the quarter and are expected to meet our expectations for the year. The group disability line reported another robust quarter with adjusted operating income of $164.8 million compared to $145.7 million in the first quarter of 2023, with the increase driven by favorable paid incidents. Along with consistently strong performance and recoveries, the group disability benefit ratio was 57.5% in the first quarter compared to 60% in the first quarter of 2023. Results for Unum U.S. Group Life and AD&D also improved compared to the year-ago period with adjusted operating income of $78.8 million for the first quarter of 2024 compared to $40.1 million in the same period a year ago. As mentioned, the benefit ratio decreased to 68.2% compared to 75% in the first quarter of 2023 driven by lower incidents. The favorability experienced in the quarter does not change our expectations of low to mid 70% benefit ratios in the coming few quarters. Adjusted operating earnings for the, Unum, for the Unum US supplemental and voluntary lines in the first quarter of 2024 increased to $141.6 million from $126.7 million, an increase of 11.8%. The increase is driven by improved underlying benefits experience year over year across all lines. Then moving to Unum International, adjusted operating income in the first quarter decreased to $37.4 million from $38.4 million in the first quarter of 2023 due to a lower benefit, due to lower benefit from inflation. Adjusted operating income for the Unum UK business decreased in the first quarter to 28.2 million pounds compared to 31 million pounds in the first quarter of 2023. Unum UK earnings grew over 10% after removing the direct inflationary benefits, which were still positive in the first quarter of 2024, but significantly lower year over year. Unum UK's underlying earnings strength has continued to grow, and we now expect the business to earn in the mid to upper 20 million pound range per quarter as inflation subsides. 
Premium income for our Unum International business segment increased by 16.8% year over year, including 15% growth in Unum UK. Similar to other segments, strong persistency in excess of 90% in both Unum UK and Poland helped to offset decreased sales in the quarter. Next, adjusted operating income for the colonial life segment increased to $113.7 million in the first quarter compared to $93.9 million in the first quarter of 2023. Premium income of $446.9 million grew at a healthy rate of 4.1% compared to a full year 2023 growth rate of 1.4%. Premium growth was driven by higher prior period sales and persistency of 78.4%, or 110 basis points greater than the year ago period. Sales in the first quarter of $103 million decreased 3.6% from prior year. In the closed block segment, adjusted operating income of $24.3 million was higher than last quarter's results of $21.3 million with relatively consistent LTC claims experience. Earnings were below our expectations due to alternative assets yielding 6.3% in the first quarter on an annualized basis compared to our long-term expectations of 8 to 10%. Since inception, our diversified alternative portfolio has achieved returns that match our long-term projections but can be volatile period to period. As we discussed in January, we expect LTC incidents to remain elevated in 2024 as a claim inventory normalizes. While LTC incidents experience in the first quarter was elevated compared to our long-term expectations, we believe the recent trend continues to indicate a pattern of returning to normal inventory levels. The LTC net premium ratio is 93.8% in the first quarter of 2024, higher than the 85.3% result in the same year ago period, due primarily to the assumption update in the third quarter of 2023. Sequentially, the MPR increased 30 basis points compared to the fourth quarter of 2023, due primarily to the impact of a large case termination in the first quarter. Finally, we continue to execute on our closed block strategy, focusing on creating value, reducing the footprint, and increasing predictability of outcomes. As we discussed in January, this includes seeking actuarially justified rate increases. Since the program refresh in the third quarter of 2023, we have achieved approximately 20% of our target, including approximately 5% in the first quarter of 2024. So then wrapping up my commentary on the segment's financial results, the adjusted operating loss in the corporate segment was $46.1 million compared to a $33.5 million loss in the first quarter of 2023, primarily driven by lower allocated net investment income and higher retirement plan expenses. Our expectation for the remainder of the year is that losses in the corporate segment will stay relatively consistent in the mid $40 million range. And then lastly, the effective tax rate of 20.3% in the first quarter was favorable to our expectation of 21.5% to 22%, driven by one-time amended filings of prior year returns. Moving now to investments, we continue to see a good environment for new money yields and risk management. Purchases made in the quarter were again at levels above our earned portfolio yield, which was 4.35% in the first quarter. Total net investment income was $513.5 million in the first quarter, compared to $508.8 million in the prior year, driven primarily by higher asset levels and higher miscellaneous investment income. Miscellaneous investment income increased in the first quarter to $20.8 million compared to $15.8 million a year ago, with income from our our alternative assets totaling $20.3 million. In addition, we continued to manage our interest rate risk by expanding our hedge and repositioning programs. Since inception of the program last year, we've entered into $2.7 billion of treasury forwards and reposition $765 million of assets, including $165 million and $65 million, respectively, in the first quarter of 2024. 
I'll end my commentary this morning with an update on our capital position. As laid out at our outlook call, we project this year to be an inflection point in the free cash flow generation profile of the company. Our outlook for strong statutory earnings with no contributions to LTC is expected to drive significant capital strength and financial flexibility in 2024. Through the first quarter, we're off to a great start. With the strong margins discussed in our gap results leading to statutory after-tax operating income of $350.5 million in the quarter and repositioning and positioning us well for our $1.2 to $1.4 billion expectation for the year. With these strong statutory earnings, the weighted average risk-based capital ratio for our traditional U.S. insurance companies strengthened further to approximately 440% and holding company liquidity remained robust at $1.4 billion. While both of these metrics are expected to fluctuate throughout the year, we do expect year-end RVC of 415 to 430% and holding company liquidity of greater than $2 billion, both well in excess of our long-term targets, providing us with capital optionality. This optionality already considers our plans to increase shareholder capital return by doubling our share repurchase run rate over 2023 levels to $500 million and increasing our shareholder dividend by 15% effective in the third quarter. So then looking ahead, as we progress throughout the year, we will continue to evaluate the best use of our excess capital in line with our priorities. Overall, we are very pleased with our first quarter results. The strong start to the year sets us up well to execute on our strategy and deliver against our financial targets. Now I'll turn the call back to Rick for his closing comments, and I look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you, Steve. You can certainly hear in our comments the excitement as we wrap the first quarter. Business performance combined with our robust capital strength has set us on a promising trajectory for the year ahead. There are plenty of topics to discuss today, so with that, let me turn the call over to the questions and turn it over to you, Krista, to facilitate the session. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad to raise your hand and join the queue. If you would like to withdraw your question, simply press star 1 again. And we ask that you please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Your first question comes from Ryan Kruger with KBW. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks. Good morning. My first question is on the pricing environment in, in group. Um, seems like there's there's some maybe debate within within the industry on on kind of the competitive environment at this point. And I guess for you specifically, you saw really favorable persistency. Um, so so it seems like um, you know that would indicate I, I, I guess le less competition. But I guess just hoping to get some more perspective on what the competitive environment is like. Um, you know, and, and kind of the debate on the need to, to give back some level of the, the outperformance in group disability. Great. Thank you, Ryan. It's Rick. Uh, we're happy to enter into that debate. I think when you think of the competitive environment out there, it is always a competitive market. And so I think I'd start with that. So we've been very consistent on that front. And when we think about competition, uh, we expect on a case by case basis, we're going to look at it and look at the fundamentals of it and, and make our decisions around what our pricing looks like. The discipline that we show has been consistent. I think that's unwavering. I think when you look at our results overall, we're very happy with, with our sales results that we have coming in on the group side as well as persistency levels and you bring that together with the pricing and the profitability it's a it's a pretty powerful mix but let me turn it over to chris to talk about maybe some more details on what we're seeing in that competitive space yeah thanks rick and thanks for the question ryan uh, no question uh competitive uh, environment is, is here to stay we, we're used to that uh, and have a lot of respect for the marketplace in that regard um, you know, one of the big things that that uh, we continue to see is is as we address you know serious uh, 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 challenges that our employer customers are facing, the conversation does move away from price. Price is always important, but as we talk about capabilities like addressing leaves to our total leave platform and connecting connecting into the HR ecosystem of choice, uh, you know, you heard Rick mention HR Connect. You know, these topics uh, take the conversation away from pure price. 
uh, and we're able to talk about ways we can help enhance their business. That, that's happening, and uh, you know, again, the market continues to move in that direction, which is very good for our business. Uh, couple that with the tradition of strong discipline underwriting, and, and we do that both on new business and reacquisition through renewals. Uh, you know, that's kind of DNA uh, that we've had uh, deep in our company uh, that will continue. Um, and you know, I, I will give a, a, a call out to our claims organization that continues to perform exceptionally well, that, that put us in this position to have strong returns, uh, so we can have conversations, uh, you, you know, with our customers about how to help them enhance their business um, uh, rather than just pure price. Thank you. And then um, on long-term care, Steve, you, you mentioned that um, there's a, I guess, up, up the, the trend in, in incidents suggests that there's a, you're on the path towards returning to normal incidents. Can you give some more color on what you're seeing there? Yeah, Ryan, it's Steve. Yeah, I would just really reiterate the messages that we've really been given over the last few quarters where we, we have been seeing uh, elevated incidents for the last year plus. We did that see that start to abate the latter half of last year, although still at elevated levels. And we really messaged, we, we thought that would continue into 2024 um, and then abate, you know, as, as we work our way through 2024. And that is really what, what we saw. Normally in the first quarter, you'll see a little bit higher incidence, a little bit higher claim mortality uh, than maybe the other quarters. That is what we saw. Those, those pretty much netted down to get us to an underwriting margin that we would have expected. Right, Ryan, I've also talked a little bit about this concept of our overall claim inventory and how that has trended over time and the fact that our claim inventory really trended below that regression line during COVID as we saw you know, lower claim incidents during that time. I would say the regression back to that line continues. Um, the, the, the trend's pretty consistent with what we've seen in prior quarters. So our, our message is pretty much the same. We think it will still stay elevated you know, for some time in 2024, but I would say you know, we are happy with kind of the trends that we saw in the first quarter. Again, we'll, we'll just have to see how it plays out through the remainder of the year. Got it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, your, next, your next question comes from the line of Elise Greenspan with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Um, good morning. Um, my first question may be a quick one on the closed block. When you guys affirm um, the full year earnings target for that business, are you assuming um, your alternative investment income will you know, get back to normal expectations for the other three quarters of the year? Yeah, Lisa, this is Steve. Uh, good, good question. And yes, the, the simplest answer to that is when we set our planning expectations, we, we set it at that 8 to 10% yield on that alternative asset portfolio. We earn, you know, right around 65 in the first quarter, but we, we do have that incorporated kind of into our thinking around uh, the, the guidance for the year. Thanks. And then you, um, you know, affirm the, you know, 5 to 10%, you know, Unum U.S., sales growth target. And you guys did point out that, you know, supplementary and voluntary sales didn't meet expectations in the first quarter. How do you see sales, um, you know, trending there over the balance of the three quarters, um, you know, when you look to hit the, you know, the full year target? Yeah, let me talk a little bit about just what our expectations. And we did talk about, although uh, some of the areas in our business were a little bit uh, slower than we would have expected coming out of the gates. Um, we are looking to make up that over the course of the year. And so are, we still feel uh, feel good about where our, our sales targets are. It's going to take some work to get there. But uh, I wouldn't actually highlight anything particular underlying that around the voluntary benefits side. Um, I think that's one we, we kind of work on quarter by quarter and, and getting back to that target is really important to us. So, Thank you. Your next question comes from Sunit Kamath with Jeffries. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Good morning. I um, wanted to start with the group disability benefit ratio. I mean, it continues to, to beat expectations. Um, can you talk a little bit about the glide path uh, in that ratio to normal? And have the underlying drivers of the better than expected benefit ratios sort of changed over the past year, or is it kind of a continuation uh, of what you saw last year? Yeah, this is Steve. I'll, I'll I'll start with the with the answer there, and then turn it over to Chris to talk a little bit about pricing and the environment. So, how we've addressed group disability is just around. There's really two drivers. One is the underlying claims performance. 
whether it's claims incidents or claims recovery. And then the other piece is, is pricing and what possible or potential pricing actions you take down the line to reflect that performance. So I'll start with performance. We've continued to see really good recovery patterns. You know, that that's our claims, uh, our claims department working well with both our customers um, as, as well as the, the employers to really get people back to work. That that's the shared objective of, of really what we do as a company. So, the the um, the recovery trends have been pretty consistent in the first quarter. I'll say incidents was a little favorable from what our expectations might have been in the first quarter. You know, we guided to a benefit ratio that would have been in the low 60s for the year. Um, this quarter it was a little bit below that, and I would say that was because of favorable claims incidents. So. Do we think that's sustainable? We, we, we do. We're, we're seeing um, sustained trends in both of those areas. I would say we can kind of see backlogs around short-term disability and feel comfortable with the performance of long-term disability block for the remainder of the year. So from just an operating performance perspective, feel good about sticking with the guidance that would be in the low 60s. Then the other piece of that equation, though, is pricing. And, you know, would, would we do anything with pricing to incorporate that level of performance. And maybe Chris, just talk a little bit about how we think about group disability pricing. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Steve and Sunit for the question. Um, you know, again, it does get back to capabilities uh, where we're able to talk about, um, you know, our, first, we have a strong disability portfolio, short-term, long-term disability. As part of our bundle, uh, the insurance coverage we can extend to our employer customers is, is phenomenal, and that gives us a, a lot of flexibility. Couple that with leave, and uh, you, you start, and those you know, almost generally, almost always go together. Uh, you're starting to talk about being a, 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 a critical partner to that employer and their employees. Um, that enables us to have conversations for the long term about how we're really going to be part of the solution uh, uh, to solve this challenging leave topic while giving their employees great cover. Uh, pricing wise, um, you know, people like long term stability in their price. So you start to talk about, you know, how you can maintain uh, this excellent experience through uh, effective claim management and a renewal strategy that keeps prices uh, kind of uh, in check over time. That, that seems to resonate very well. So it's a combination of, of bundled portfolio with leave management and long-term stability and pricing uh, that fits very well with our underwriting DNA. Okay, that, that makes sense. Thanks for that. Um, and then I guess the second one for Rick on um, long-term care. You know, one of the things that we have observed um, in the market is just the combination of different types of insurance risks, uh, particularly on the asset intensive side, uh, in order to get risk transfer done. And, you know, post your individual IDI uh, risk transfer solution a couple of years ago, I, I wouldn't think that you would have a ton of that asset intensive stuff, but just curious if that's the right read or how you'd think about sort of combining uh, different blocks of business if you were to do something. Thanks. Yeah, so you talked about uh, asset intensity in terms of our blocks of business. So the IDI was one that, that had some of that. We're happy to go through that transaction. Long-term care is is clearly our other uh, asset intensive business. And that's why we made the comments about uh, the current rate environment uh, being good for us. Our team is doing a great job of putting money to work uh, behind that block of business. And then the asset intensity kind of goes down throughout the course of the business. And you think about our group lines of business a little bit on the group disability, although that portfolio has shrunk as the, the claim inventory has shrunk there as well. And then on the voluntary benefit side, really very little in terms of asset intensity. So. So I think uh, if your question is getting at, you know, kind of where we look at uh, where that asset, it, it is in long-term care when we think about what we're trying to do today and and uh, making sure that we're hedging uh, what we're doing there and, and the overall mix. But, but we're happy about uh, how it looks between our insurance risks, our asset mix that we have today, um, and then the overall. Steve, you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I, th I think you might have been getting at a little bit is uh, just around potential transactions and and just different businesses that maybe you could pair up with a long-term care transaction. And I, I wouldn't put that, I wouldn't bucket that just in asset intensive businesses to go with that. I think counterparties are looking at just risk diversification generally. And so, you know, we, we do have blocks that I think would, you know, would match that criteria um, with, with different counterparties. Got it. Yeah, that was the, the thrust of my question. So thanks for that. Yep. Yep. Your next question comes from the line of Tom Gallagher with Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Good morning. Um few few follow-ups on long-term care. Um 
I guess the first one is, so I, I heard, uh, Steve, your comment about long-term care claim trends. If they do remain elevated somewhat throughout the course of the year, is it likely you'd have to strengthen gap reserves again in the three third quarter review uh, or not necessarily? Does that really just depend on a long-term assumption? And I assume statutory should be pretty bulletproof, though, even even if there was something uh, adjusted for gap. That, that's my first question. Yeah, Tom, I think there were two questions in there, but I'll, I'll count it as one. Um, yeah, for, from, from a gap perspective, I, I think you're thinking about it right. You know, we look at all of our assumptions set on an annual basis that's required under LDTI. And we, we will do that in the third quarter like we normally do. We, we, we look at a pretty long experience set when we set those assumptions and think more long term about them. So we'll, we'll take into account the, the recent elevated claims experience that we've seen, but we'll, we'll also take into account all the experience that we've seen over, over the last year. And we did do a pretty comp- comprehensive review last year, but we'll go through that process in the third quarter on, on a gap basis. And then on the statutory side, I would just refer back to some of the discussion that we had as part of our outlook meeting, where we do feel like we, we have quite a bit of, of you know margin or buffer for adverse deviation in in, an, in our assumption set on a best estimate basis. We talked about the two point eight billion dollars of protection, which is really um, you know the difference between our recorded statutory reserves and kind of our economic view of best estimate, along with the excess capital that we have uh, behind the LTC line. So uh, we continue to feel pretty good that we, we got the right buffers there for, for any deviation in, in our actual experience or even any, any deviation in our best estimate. And I just refer you back to some of the sensitivities that we gave as part of that uh, presentation back in January. Gotcha. And then just yeah. for a follow-up, the large case uh, group lapse for long-term care that you had in the quarter that impacted the benefit ratio. Did you lose the group life and disability along with that, or did the employer just discontinue the LTC coverage? Yeah, and and just that one clarification, it, it impacted our net premium ratio. That that was a large group LTC case that terminated. Did have margin in it. We um, released that margin basically, and it was buffered into the benefit ratio itself. We did not lose the other coverages. That that was specific to the LTC coverage. Is there just just out of curiosity? I mean, to me, that probably is more positive than negative. If you have at the group level, employers lapsing LTC coverage, all, all things considered, um, is that yeah. is that kind of a, is that was that just voluntary or is there an effort to to do that at Unum? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't comment on you know whether it's voluntary or not. We we we're always talking to our groups about providing value to them through our our various products and services. Um, what what I would say is it's a reduction of risk in the LTC book, which I think is always a positive thing. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Your next question comes from Joel Hurwitz with Dowling and Partners. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Uh, I wanted to follow up on on Ryan's earlier question on on persistency. And Chris, I I heard your commentary on Oh, capability is, is a major driver now uh, with, with retaining business or, or getting new business. I, I guess, can you just talk about uh, the, persis- the persistency of your business with some of those capabilities like HR Connect or the Total Lead product? Yeah, uh, 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 thanks for the question, Joel. It, it, the uh, no question capabilities, you know, again, it changes the conversation in the prospect stage of engaging uh, with, with an employer. It also changes the relationship over time. So, um, you, you know, we're consistently talking to customers about, you, you know, what we need for appropriate price up or down. But when done in context of, uh, you know, leave management uh, or uh, the HR Connect ecosystem that we're participating in, um, you, you know, you can you can just tell there's a lean to, to drive toward long-term partnerships. 
so persistency does uh, increase uh, when you're tied to a capability like HR Connect. Um, you know, that's a very, that's a, a mature offering at this point. We've been partnering with Workday for, you know, over five years uh, in, in terms of customers who choose that platform and uh, other platforms like uh, like Workforce Now, uh, you know, mul- multiple years in. So we are seeing that favorable uh, retention. And again, uh, we get excited about the, the discussion that focuses on, you know, what are the products can we add to that bundle? Uh, you know, as well as, as long-term price stability. So uh, I think the theme of your question is, is, is spot on without getting into too much detail on specific numbers. I would just add to that, Joel. I, I think as Chris is getting, it's multifaceted. So that relationship, uh, when all those pieces, pricing, connections, the relationship management, all those things come into play. We're really happy with where the persistency was. Like you said, it's the highest levels that we've seen, uh, but it does come back to that ongoing relationship management. Okay, makes sense. Uh, and then switching over to, to Colonial Life, can you can you talk about what you're seeing from a, a recruit and productivity standpoint, and, and maybe provide some more color on 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 the gather technology and what gives you the confidence that you can achieve that five to ten percent sales growth target this year? Yeah, thanks, Joel. This is Tim Arnold. Appreciate the question. <clears throat> uh, so Rick mentioned this, but I'd like to just reiterate that. Overall premium growth in the quarter was 4.1% versus 1.4% last year. So we're pleased with that. You mentioned Gather, just for those who may not be aware of what it is, it's a benefits administration and human capital management platform that we can make available in the small end of the market, especially at no cost to an employer. And uh, we've we've seen independent third-party data that suggests that about 90% of employers with fewer than 100 employees do not have a benefits-enabled technology uh, platform, so or technology-enabled benefits administration platform. So we're excited about our proprietary offering there. We saw very strong growth and adoption rates of Gather in the first quarter, continuing the great growth that we saw in 2023. Another capability that we have that's resonating in the marketplace currently is our cross-brand solution. So we're partnering with our peers at Unum US and Colonial Life agents have access to those uh, group employer paid products now. In the quarter, we saw premium from those products grow at 44%, and we saw a 43% increase in the agents at Colonial Life who are selling uh, Unum Group products. So uh, where we saw the softness in the quarter was on re-enrollments of our existing clients, and uh, we think that that's something that's that can be addressed and will enable us to get back into the sort of the lower end of that range that we gave that investor day. Okay, thank you. Your next question. Your next question comes from the line of Jimmy Bueller with JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Uh, so first, just a question on long-term care along the lines of what's been asked uh, previously as well. But um, you mentioned elevated incidents, and you had assumed that, but are your reserves right now predicated on an improvement in incidents, or is the vir- variability in incidents not enough to uh, cause a charge, even if it stays around uh, recent levels? Yeah, Jimmy, I just go back to the statements I made before. You know, we'll go through our normal process, our annual process in the third quarter. We'll look at all of our assumption sets, and and we'll look at that over the long term. So I, I wouldn't comment on kind of any, you know, any individual uh, trends that we're seeing in a, in a certain quarter. We'll, we'll take a long-term view of that when we go through. And, and we, we did just go through a pretty comprehensive review back in the third quarter of last year. So we'll, we'll take into account what we've been seeing more recently, but um, I, I think it's premature to, to really discuss that. Okay, and then on, on buybacks, um, I realize you've increased the amount, uh, a decent amount this year. Uh, you're raising the dividend as well, but if we look at your stat income generation and then hold co liquidity uh, RBC levels, it suggests that you have the flexibility to do more than what you're doing. Um, so is the 500 million sort of the number that you'll do this year and it's sort of set in stone, stone and you'll review it next year or is there a possibility that if your results continue to surprise on the upside um, that you might revisit that later this year? 
Yeah, it's a good question, Jimmy. And so when you think about the overall capital generation, I think both Steve and I uh, reiterated very happy with how we started the year, both from a generation perspective. And I think important, different than it's been in previous years is there's not not a use that will be going uh, towards long term care. So what we generate um, is for us is for us to be using right now. We're seeing as we talked about in our outlook meeting. We're going to see the capital levels grow, um, particularly in terms of holding company cash. Saw that in the first quarter, and so that's a trend we put out there. We've increased the pace of redeployment of capital to shareholders, and so we're happy about the $500 million. Uh, you ask, is that locked in stone? I think you know, capital is something that needs to be managed on a daily basis, and so we'll, we'll keep uh, obviously looking at that. Um, but we're very happy with the plans that we have in place and what the execution on the first quarter looks like uh, towards those plans. You know, I'd go back to our uses. We, we still want to grow. So uh, in terms of growing the business at the rates we have, at the returns we have, that's first and foremost, both from an organic perspective. And then on the M&A side, we've talked about the types of capabilities that we'd like to bring on to continue to grow that core business. So that probably gives you some sense. You know, we're tracking as we had, not a lot of different messages than we had in the first quarter, but we think about capital, we think about its uses uh, frequently in terms of what it can be. So nothing locked in stone. Uh, we, we, we're very happy with where we are today. Okay, and then fair to assume that the lapse of the LTC case is a slight headwind for earnings going forward for that division? Yeah, it's it's immaterial for earnings. It, it was kind of a large impact Thank you. in the period, but re really not material for ongoing earnings. Okay, thanks. Your next question comes from the line of Wilma Burtis with Raymond James. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Um, RBC and stat earnings were, were strong in the quarter. Could you just talk about the capital generation and deployment trajectory for the remainder of the year? Thank you. Yeah, Wilma, well, this is Steve. I, I can take one. Uh, I can take that one. I would say very consistent with the ranges that we would have given at, at Investor Day. We're not really, you know, changing our view of that. We are happy that we started off strong, and I would say first quarter results were, you know, a little bit above what our expectations would have been. But at this point, don't feel like the need to really change any of the guidance for, for either GAAP earnings trajectories or statutory earnings trajectories um, or the the, um, the relevant capital metrics. Okay, thank you. And is $37 million of earnings in international a good run rate? And talk a little bit about how much that figure was boosted by UK inflation benefits and what you're seeing there. Thank you. Yeah. Mark, you want to talk about that? Yeah, I'll I'll take that. So, I mean, if we work in if we work in local currency, um, then the earnings we produced this year put us in a range of twenty five to thirty million uh, sterling for the quarter, and we think that we can continue to uh, produce in in that in that sort of range. Um, and um, in terms of the inflation impact. We were we've seen a reduction of about five or six million dollars um, in the quarter, and it's now largely disappeared. So there's a small amount of inflation that will continue through the year, but largely it's out of the way now. Probably the other way to think about that, Wilma, is the performance for the current quarter is is probably something that's sustainable because the impact of inflation was pretty minimal. Okay, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Mike Ward with City. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Thanks. Good morning. Um, maybe uh, maybe more for Chris, but just curious about um, what you're seeing across the key benefits product lines. Um, trying to think if you have any um, sense of pricing between different employer sizes. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mike. Good question. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, the small end of the market uh, uh, price is, is probably a little less sensitive. Um, you, you know, uh, when you get into mid and large, there's probably a little bit more of a, a sharp eye on uh, how price plays. You know, that said, we do feel it across, uh, you know, all all angles on the, on the, on the market. Um, everybody's trying to make a good decision. It gets back to, to you know, we have a specific uh, offering and strategy for, uh, for market segments, uh, small, medium, and large. Um, when we bring that 
to the to the conversation. Uh, it helps us get a fair price. It helps us renew at a fair price. Uh, that's consistent across. We just get there in different ways. So again, up market, you're talking uh, heavily about leave management. You're talking heavily about HR Connect. Down market, it's some of the things that Tim talked about in terms of uh, you know a gather type offering where our group insurance shows up. You know it, that that gets a little bit less less price sensitive because you're solving a different problem. And we can do that in a couple day a couple different ways with our my Unum platform, Gather, uh, or connecting with Ben Admins of choice in that small end of the market. Thanks, Chris. Um, and then one last one, just on the on the closed block termination, just because it is uh, a little bit uh, unique. But um, it, you know, Steve, it, your tone sort of suggests that it was one off. But uh, I guess if you could, could you confirm that, or should we think about it maybe as like a risk management tool that? That uh, that we hadn't really thought of before for LTC. Thanks. Yeah, Mike, I, I would consider a one-off. Uh, again, we're, we're always talking to our customers across all product lines about you know, the value we can provide to them. And in some of those conversations, the the customer just decides that you know that they want to move a different way, and so that's what happened with with this group. Okay. Your next question comes from the line of Wes Carmichael, Carmichael with Autonomous Research. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Just just wanted to follow up on this group, uh, LTC case slaps. It, it sounds like your commentary is positive, but you know I think it was the driver of the increase in the net premium ratio in the quarter, which I guess implies that it was profitable relative to the overall block. I, I just want to make sure that I'm thinking about that correctly. Steve, is this is this a good thing in reducing risk exposure, or is it a bad thing? Is it you know, the overall block is, yeah. is a little bit worse worse off overall. Yeah, I, I would say you're right. It's it's positive from a risk uh, reduction perspective. That There was margin in the case, and so that's why it drove the MPR up to 30 basis points. Um, it does not have a material impact on our go-forward earnings. And, and I, I would say, um, you know, we, we, we just feel like it's a one-off thing. A lot of these group cases are 1-1 one, one effective dates. So in, uh, HR departments are reassessing kind of their wallet share. And so I'd, I'd consider it just a one-off thing. All right. And, and just one more on LTC. But you, you talked about not contributing capital to the close block going forward. And, you know, there's $2.8 billion protection here. But, you know, I'm trying to square this away with what's disclosed in new premium rating file, rate increase filings for 2024. And I know last year you previewed that you were going to take some more rate increases, but it looks like you're basically going after doubling the individual LTC policyholders rate for Unum America. So, you know, your comments to state regulators said that the experience review that you did last year is kind of driving the need for this additional rate increase. And I'm, I'm just trying to square that away with, you know, the idea that statutory reserves are significantly redundant. Yeah, what, what I'd say, it's a totally different, I, I guess, construct as far as how those rate increase um, rate increase requests are capital or are calculated. You look at really the lifetime benefit ratio um, to get to the actual justified amount that that you can ask for. That's much different than our current statutory reserve construct, which has quite a bit of margin in it. When when, when you look at those rate increases, you're not really able to incorporate what I would say would, would be the same levels of margin into your assumptions that it is more of a best estimate. I'm also, I, I'm not gonna really comment on that specific filing, but we're not doubling individual rates right now um, as part of the, the current program. The, the focus right now is, is mostly on the group um, block of business who we've got the most opportunity there. So I, I won't comment on that specific filing. Your next question comes from the line of Mark Hughes with Truist Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Any uh, themes to mention in the group life mortality? Sounds like it was uh, better. Is that a multi-quarter trend or uh, just just this quarter? Yeah, no. Um, it, it is interesting what we've seen over the last couple quarters in group life and AD&D. And in the fourth quarter last year, our loss ratio is just below 70%. This quarter, it was uh, just a little bit above 68%. So so both very good quarters and quite a bit below what our expectation would be. You know, I reiterated in my comments, our expectation continues to be in the low 70s. What we saw in the fourth quarter last year was more around um, perform, favorable performance in our waiver premium part of that business. 
we consider that more of just kind of a one-off thing that that we saw in the fourth quarter and and volatility and that played out in the first quarter where the waiver premium performance was was right at expectations I'll say then if you just look at kind of core mortality, the, the actual incidence of mortality in the fourth quarter, it was pretty close to our expectations, I would say. Um, and then when we got into the first quarter, it was very favorable to what our expectations would have been. And so that's what's really driving the uh, 68.2% benefit ratio in the first quarter. We, we, again, think that's just volatility around mortality, and that's why we're given guidance if you look for the remainder um, of 2024, we, we think the loss ratio will be back up into the uh, in the low 70s, and, that, and that's how we price for it. Yeah, was this an easier flu season? I hadn't looked at that data. You know, it, it's it's interesting. You have to kind of look across age categories. I, I'd say w- what we saw was probably in the older age. Think uh, LTC claimants. It was probably a fairly regular flu season, uh, just the mortality that we saw there. Um, but the group life block is more in kind of the working age group, and just what we saw there was was lower mortality. It's it's a relatively small book as well, so so you can have a bit of volatility there. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Your next your next question comes from the line of Joshua Shanker with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi there. Thank you for taking my question this morning. Hope you're all well. Uh, question about long-term history and after periods of notable wage inflation and full employment, do, is there an outlook for what happens to volumes and price um, in this macro backdrop if we look out a few years? Yeah, so that's a good one, Josh. Appreciate that to uh, wrap up. I, I think, you know, we're in that period of uh, wage inflation and, and good employment numbers. I think there's been a lot of discussion here over the last couple of years of that abating, which we have not seen. They, I think those two are still looking very good. It's been a long time since since we've actually seen that. And so when you go back in history and, and how we come out of that period um, can be very very different. I think probably the latest example that we've, we've seen some of that inflationary type, at least on the wage side, would, would be uh, over a decade that we've seen. Um, but we think the employment picture actually looks good. How benefits are structured today are good for people in that time. And Chris, I don't know if you'd add anything to that. It's, a, it's an interesting question. I think uh, we're, we're focused probably a little bit nearer term in terms of what the environment looks like today, but but it's a good hypothetical. Yeah, and you know, I, I think we see continued interest in the whole kind of talent topic uh, where, where we need uh, good benefits packages to attract and retain uh, good talent. And as long as that persists, you know, our ability to be creative in, in terms of what we bring, how we present it, and how we can, uh, you know, enable uh, the employee population to utilize it, that's, that's good for us and our employers um, as, as we look forward. So, uh, you know, in addition to what Rook is saying, we, we, we like the fact that attract and retain is still a major topic. I, I don't mean to be labor the point, but just trying to learn more. Is there anything that might be learned on a local level that you've seen in, in, in different geographies that have had a period of of, of boom or whatnot about what happens to your offering or what happens to the disability um, uh, opportunity post a period of significant growth? You know, I, I think the, the thing I would say is, you know, we think about it in terms of, of what our employers offering and, and, and that will, you know, kind of flow a little bit with what their attract and retain needs are. And then on, on the back end, it's, it's claims management and uh, having a, a superior team uh, who can manage through cycles where there are different, you know, kind of economic factors at play in terms of bringing people back to work, uh, which is good for everyone. You know, we, we do a phenomenal job operationally uh, as experts in this space. Uh, as we add lead management, we, can, we become more important. So I think we're going to continue to have our ability to kind of uh, find the right uh, type of customers to partner with and, and, and help them enhance their business uh, through different cycles. Yeah, I, I just add to that, Josh. I mean, if you look at the go back within the last 10 years, what we've seen. So we have been in that wage inflation. That's a pretty short-lived type of thing. 
Uh, if we go back to just before that, where we saw the exact opposite with what happened as a result of the pandemic, you know, our business model held up very well through that period of time. And so if what you're asking and thinking about is when you get into a much more difficult economic situations coming off of good times, will you see higher claims levels? Will you see different to premium growth? And I think through the last 10 years, we've been able to grow very well through both, which is a very difficult time, one of the worst we've seen in terms of the pandemic, and then coming out of that a very, a very good inflation period. That's where we sit today. And I think where we sit today is in a really strong position. The processes are in place. Our product set is really good. Um, the overall structure of the company is is, is good as well. And so I'd, I'd leave you on that very optimistic point in terms of uh, what we look to the future. We remain very optimistic. Well, thank you for uh, indulging me. Uh, have a wonderful morning. Thank you, Josh. This does conclude our question and answer session. I will now turn the call back over to Rick McKinney for closing comments. Great, thank you. That was a great, uh, great question to wrap on. I appreciate uh, that, Josh. We want to thank everybody for joining us this morning and your continued interest in Unum. We are very delighted with our first quarter results and optimistic about uh, the outlook for 2024 and beyond. And so with that, let's conclude uh, today's call. We'll look forward to connecting with you all again in the very near future. 